Okay, then I think we can start. Uh, good morning and welcome back to the second week of our school. I hope you all had a nice weekend um, and are now fully recharged to listen to every word Soren has to tell you. So enjoy. Okay, yeah. So good morning also from me to everybody. Welcome back to the second lecture now on uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. And uh, so today we're going to uh, continue right off where we, where we left last, uh, at the end of last lecture. So brief reminder, what did, we, what, did we, what did we do last time? So last time we somehow looked at the problem of non-equilibrium dynamics, really sort of looking at its foundations. Yeah? So um, we started with the, with the construction of a non-equilibrium generating functional uh, for, for a quantum field theory where we can really go ahead and uh, in principle if we were, if we knew how to compute this, uh, this generating functional, really study non-equilibrium dynamics in a quantum field theory, the problem that we came across is that that somehow suffers from a severe sign problem. And so, um, so we realized that in order to be able to actually study non-equilibrium dynamics, uh, we will well, necessarily have to live with some sort of approximation. So we then went ahead and, and, and somehow um, <coughs> looked at uh, this classical statistical approximation, which we formally developed as an expansion of the, of the non-equilibrium path integral in H bar. Uh, so it's not surprising that we somehow recover classical dynamics in that limit. And so, um, so what we found is that by doing this expansion, we actually got rid of the sign problem, right? So this is really provides us now with a direct approach to actually go ahead and calculate things. Uh, and so this is, so, so, so I just wanted to mention this here. So this is actually an approach that is somehow not unique to, to our community. I mean, this is used to, you know, in a variety of contexts, and so it also comes under different names in, in sort of different communities. Yeah? So we typically call this classical statistical approximation. So for instance, in condensed metaphysics, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is named often, uh, oftentimes uh, the truncated Wigner approximation. Yeah? Um, and I think there are other names for this as well. Yeah? So now, okay, so we have now somehow developed this expansion. We know, we, we know what we're doing, what approximations we're making essentially to, to, to go there. Um, so natural next questions to ask, and that's what, we, what we're going to now be covering within these lectures, is what are actually now the possible applications of this approach? So what can we go out and actually calculate? What are some other phenomena that we can study? Yeah. And, but also somehow the question, what is actually the nature of the of somehow the things that we are neglecting, right? And um, well, that in a sense that in essence also determines the range of applicability of our approach, right? Yeah, because approach is only applicable if what we are neglecting can actually be considered as small. Okay, so <clears throat> so towards the end of the lecture, we kind of started to look at this uh, this first example, and so I just put the slides here again to just briefly sort of set the stage again because we're still going to go through this example, yeah. And so, so, so that was um, just to illustrate now how these techniques work. Um, I was going to discuss the example of the critical dynamics of a scalar field. So we're going to look at the scalar field theory, right? Which, uh, which has a, which for a negative mass squared has a second order phase transition at a finite temperature. Okay, so this we discussed, right? And so the point was that the physics in the vicinity of a second order phase transition is universal, and that's true for both for somehow the static. Uh, static properties of the system, yeah, such as, for instance, divergence of the correlation lengths or scaling of the order parameter in the vicinity of the transition. And the beauty about this is, of course, that you know we can we can study a physics that's interesting to us in uh, in the context of, of very difficult theories such as QCD. Uh, at least the universal aspects we can study within simple models such as the scalar field theory. Okay. Now this is this is the part for somehow the for formal, somehow the static critical behavior, but really what we're interested here in is dynamics, right? Okay, and so we also discussed towards the end of the of the lecture that again um, again dynamics in the vicinity of the critical point also features universal aspects, uh, but somehow unlike the static critical behavior, there's additional things that come into play here. Uh, and that is not surprising, really, right? Because, for instance, conservation laws and things like that, they affect the, they affect the dynamics of the system, yeah? And so we had this picture where essentially a given static universality class can split up into many, many, uh, many different dynamic universality classes. Yeah? Now, the basis for, for, for somehow being able to now perform a computation that has anything meaningful to say about 
the quantum field theory in a classical theory is exactly based on this universality in this context, right? So what determines this dynamic universality classes are somehow the symmetries of the system, the dimensionality, but also the conservation laws, okay? And so <clears throat> as long as there are somehow no quantum anomalies, right, things, symmetries which are broken on the quantum level, which are, which are present at the classical level, yeah, the symmetry content of the theories is the same, both regarding statics and, and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and dynamics. Uh, and so we can actually study the universal properties in the vicinity of the critical point using this effective classical theory. And so that's where we, that's where we left off last time. Okay, so now this is always sort of, a, sort of a funny point, right? So at least I always find this kind of a little bit confusing when I get this first in my head, right? So we're talking about equilibrium systems here, right? And so what does it actually mean to somehow talk about dynamics in the context of an equilibrium system, right? So clearly if I look at something, because, equi because thermal equilibrium obviously is a time translation invariant state, right? So there's kind of, so, so you may naively be thinking, right? There's no dynamics going on, actually, right? And so that, of course, is true, right? If you look at something like a one-point function, right? Like the expectation value of the field, right? Uh, then this is effectively a static quantity. It will not change over the evolution of the system, right? Nevertheless, there is, of course, <coughs> of course, also the thermal equilibrium, right? Is a, is a highly dynamical state, right? I mean, things are going on all the time, right? Yeah? Just to actually see what is going on, right? I don't have to look at these sort of static quantities, yeah? but I have to look at unequal time correlation functions. Yeah? So for instance, uh, this object here, right? So already interesting dynamic information is been contained, for instance, in these two-point functions. Yeah? Okay, this was actually, so there should be like a T prime here, right? Otherwise, this would again be a static quantity. Yeah? <laughs> okay? Yeah? And so, so to actually access dynamical, dynamical features of the theory, I at least have to go to the level of two-point fun correlation functions, right? Because otherwise, everything would be static. Now, okay, now you may ask, okay, so what kind of, uh, kind of two-point functions are there in the theory, right? And so that was also something that somehow came up in the, in, the, in the discussion that we had during the last lecture is that if you're actually looking at the quantum theory, right, then in principle, if we have a two-point function, we can distinguish exactly two different operator orderings, right? So we could kind of have this operator to the left and this to the right or vice versa, right? Yeah? And so generally, there will be two independent two-point correlation functions for, for, for a given quantum theory, right? And so I can, I, can, I can kind of organize them in whatever basis I want, right? So one possibility would be to literally consider these definite orderings over here. However, it turns out that somehow for the purpose of, uh, of discussing a lot of the things that, uh, that we'll be talking about, it's actually better to use somehow a different basis here, uh, where instead of kind of considering definite operator orderings, we consider one half times the anti-commutator, from which we subtract the expectation value of the field. So this is just the this is just the this is just the one point function subtracted here, uh, and the and the, and the commutator, right? And then, so after out of clearly out of the anti commutator and the commutator, right? I can then then go back and sort of build whatever operator ordering I'm actually interested in at the end of the day. Okay. Okay. Good. So now the question is, what do these things actually tell us, right? And so it turns out that these, these two type of objects that I've defined here, they actually contain rather different, uh, rather different informations. Uh -huh. And so again, you may be, yeah, so, so, so again, one simple way to, to, to perhaps think about this is, so for instance, if I, so, so imagine you have, say, a harmonic oscillator or something, right? So then, then you know that, okay, so you know a certain combination of, certain combination of, uh, or field operators will give you something like a retarded propagator, and that will somehow tell you how, how a given fluctuation on your system would evolve, right? Uh, but you also know that, for instance, the expectation value of phi squared or so, right, would be like the, like the potential energy of your harmonic oscillator, right? And that's somehow a very, that's somehow a very different kind of information that you have from how, a, how, how sort of a hypothetical fluctuation would propagate on your system. Uh, and so there are basically two-point correlation functions which characterize, uh, which characterize somehow actual amount of physical fluctuations that are present in the systems and which characterize somehow the way that a system actually responds to, say, for instance, an external perturbation. Okay? 
And so, indeed, uh, so these I haven't, I of course, haven't chosen these these, these two, two two correlation functions for, uh, for 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 no reason, right? Yeah. Um, turns out that these are exactly the, the exactly the two objects which, in principle, exactly answer these two questions. Uh, and so this is actually I find that this is actually quite uh, <laughs> most conveniently seen by somehow making the translation from the from the from the quantum theory to the classical statistical theory right away on the level of these correlation functions. Uh -huh. Okay, so what do these correlation functions map to in in now our classical theory? Uh -huh. And so. If we if we look, for example, at the, well, let's perhaps look first look at the row here, which denotes the spectral function, right? Then, okay, so the spectral function is given by i times the commutator of the fields, uh, but then we know that essentially under the rules of canonical quantization, right, the commutator maps in the classical theory onto what? It maps onto the Poisson bracket, right? I mean, that's basically that, that's basically canonical quantization rules, right? So, in the classical statistical theory, this would be okay. It would actually be the negative of the Poisson bracket, right? So, this is kind of a convention that doesn't really matter that much, right? And so, okay, we can then okay. I mean, so what is the Poisson bracket, right? So, the Poisson bracket is a functional derivative with respect to the fields and its in its conjugate momenta, and so we can actually evaluate this, right? And so, what we see is that okay. At the end of the day, what the spectral function becomes out to be uh, is a derivative, is a functional derivative of the field at a given time and a given position with respect to the momentum field uh, uh, at another time and another position. Uh, and so clearly, what this is characterizing is that essentially, how would our field respond, right, if we give it sort of just this tiny little kick at some other time, right? Uh, so the spectral function is somehow not not an object which tells us about the actual fluctuations that are present in the system, right? But it really tells us about somehow how the system responds if, say, we exert a little kick on it. Okay? Good. Then on the other hand, we have this, uh, we have this other object here, yeah, which is called the statistical correlation function, F. And so there we have the, so there we have the anti-commutator fields. Yeah? Now, of course, okay, so in the classical, I mean, in the classical statistical theory, there's no, I mean, fields are fields, right? They're not, they're not operators, right? So they commute, so one half times the anti-commutator simply maps to somehow the product of the fields, right? Yeah, and so that actually characterizes the, characterizes the fluctuations of the fields that are present in the system, right? Yeah, and in particular, how the fluctuations at somehow one time and one position are correlated with the fluctuations at another time and another position, yeah, and so, why am I saying? Well, and, and so, so this is also the reason that we're somehow subtracting the subtracting the average field value here to really carry, to really get at the, the properties of the of the fluctuation. Yeah? So the important message here is, is here that somehow the statistical function f right gives us the actual excitations that are present in the systems, whereas the spectral function rho somehow characterizes possible excitation modes of the system yeah, that we could somehow excite. Now, okay, so. Typically, everything that everything that can happen will happen, right? And so, in equilibrium, we actually know essentially the essentially the probability which really will happen. Namely, it turns out that actually these these two these two correlation functions, which somehow naively or under most general circumstances, for instance, out of equilibrium, they would be completely independent. But in equilibrium, these two objects are related, uh, and so they're related by something which is called uh, which is called the fluctuation dissipation relation. I mean. I assume you have seen something like that, something like that before. If you haven't, it's actually relatively. I mean, it's actually extremely easy to rewrite this. You can just do a spectral representation. This, this takes perhaps a page, or no, not even a page, to work out. So this is relatively easy to work out. Yeah? And so there you then exa see exactly this behavior. Yeah? So that if you look at the actual excitation presence in the system, well, they're given by the possible excitations in the system yeah, times a typical occupancy factor, a typical occupancy factor which in the quantum system is given by the Bose-Einstein distribution. Yeah. So I have I have tacitly gone here from somehow real space to Fourier space. Yeah. So the Bose-Einstein distribution is a function of the frequency or the energy of that excitation. Okay. Yeah. And so in the classical theory, okay, so basically you can you can again take the limit of very, very small omega. Uh, and so at very small omega, the Bose-Einstein distribution actually goes as t over omega. 
Uh, and so it turns out that this is actually the, the, the kind of fluctuation dissipation relation you get, uh, you get in a classical theory. Uh, so you can either get this by somehow taking, again, taking the limit h bar, h bar going to zero of the, of the quantum theory here, right? Or you can directly derive this on the level of somehow the consistency relations. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the fluctuation dissipation relation in the classical theory itself. Uh, okay, and so. So, 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 let, so let's get back what we want to do, right? So what we want to do is we want to somehow study a dynamics in equilibrium, right? We want to study this at the level of two-point functions. Well, but if there are only two independent, uh, only if there's only one independent two-point function, it actually suffices to calculate one of them. And so typically, the beast that one is after here is somehow the calculation of this uh, calculation, calculation of the spectral function. And so there's actually an interesting question somehow attached to this, uh, to, to studying this. Uh, studying the critical behavior of the spectral function, even in this very simple model. Yeah? And so the reason is that, um, so I told you the physics somehow should be universal, and it's characterized by a dynamical scaling exponent. Yeah? And so if you just go to, to somehow the literature and you look up what the scaling exponent is, right, you'll find it's somewhere around 2, okay? It's 2 point something. I don't even know what the top of my head. It doesn't really matter, right? You can calculate it in mean field. You actually get 1 for this model, okay? So there's really some kind of non-trivial thing that has to happen beyond mean field, right? That somehow lifts this exponent from the from the mean field value for a relativistic theory, which is, I mean, in a relativistic theory, momenta and frequencies behave exactly the same. That's how you get z equals one uh, to somehow the actual critical behavior, yeah, where you get a where you get a dynamical critical exponent that is somewhere around two, yeah? and so that is somehow. Somehow, why this is actually, even though this may seem somewhat trivial at this stage, is actually quite an interesting problem to look at. Okay, so, but really why I wanted to discuss this is that somehow this gives us now a very solid ground to somehow see how these, how these techniques work in practice. Yeah, first of all, for somehow a very simple system, which is somehow a classical system in thermal equilibrium. Okay? So, now how do we go and how do we actually calculate this thing? And so the sequence of steps is kind of, is kind of very, very simple. Yeah? So, of course, the problem that we still have to deal with, right? So I, so I told you, okay, we can, in certain ranges, map quantum dynamics to classical dynamics here on the basis of universality, right? But also, studying dynamics of a classical field theory is, in principle, nothing that's, you know, absolutely obvious how to do. Yeah? And so, okay, the first step in this, as usual, is to somehow go from a problem which is infinite dimensional to actually make the problem finite dimensional, right? And so kind of step zero in this thing is, is now to uh, discretize the classical scalar field on a lattice and somehow make the problem finite dimensional. So typically what is done in, 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 in the context of these, of these real-time approaches, and that's actually different from somehow Euclidean lattice QCD where you would somehow discretize the action, uh, so you would discretize both space and time simultaneously, is one actually only, usually, typically one only discretizes the space. Uh, I mean, you could also do it in the action formalism. Uh, but the reason for that is essentially that, okay, when you're, when you're going to solve equations of motions, you're typically going to need a very time, for small time step anyway. So you kind of keep time continuous in the first place and only discretize the space to somehow limit the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, Okay, so what does one do, right? So, okay, when, when somehow, let's say we're in two dimensions here, right? Okay, so you put your, put your thing on a lattice, right? Certain number of sides, different spacing in, in, same spacing in each direction, right? And then you pretend you kind of know the field values at each and every side of this lattice, yeah? And then, okay, in principle, all you have to do, right, is you have to write down a Hamiltonian as a function of this, of this uh, lattice uh, field and momentum variables, right? Which, reproduces what you have in the continuum to a given accuracy, right? And so for the scalar field theory, this is really extremely simple, actually, right? So, okay, yeah, so we have usual kinetic term, so that's just the same, right? You have the potential term that's also the same, right? And so, okay, in this case, the, the gradient of the field, right, which is, which is one of the terms is then just replaced by somehow discrete derivative. Okay, so that is, that is step zero, right? So, Okay, so we have now put the theory on a lattice, right? Good, and then, okay, step, the next step is then, okay, we wanna somehow study dynamics, right? But in order to, so we know our system's gonna obey classical equations of motion, right? But we need some sort of initial condition, okay? Right, and so that's gonna be the only difference between this here and what we're later gonna do in non-equilibrium is gonna be the initial condition, okay? 
Okay, so to do this in equilibrium, of course, this is, is relatively simple, right? So in equilibrium, right, okay, you want to study a classical equilibrium state, right? And so you know that, okay, so the, the classical equilibrium state uh, is given by or the probability to find the, 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 find a certain field configuration in a classical equilibrium ensemble uh, is given by e to the minus beta times the classical Hamilton function. Okay, uh, so basically what you have to do is you have to you have to take your initial conditions, choose them according to these, this kind of a probability distribution, okay? And there's efficient algorithms to do this at the end of the day. I mean, so this is then indeed uh, very similar to the way you would somehow generate configurations in lattice QCD or so say. Uh, so you can generate these initial field configurations satisfying this, uh, this classical thermal grade using, for instance, the this, this, this standard metropolis algorithm, or you can do Langevin dynamics or hybrid Monte Carlo. It, it really doesn't matter, right? I mean, there's simple, there's are simple algorithms to, to generate your thermal initial state configuration. Okay, so that in principle summarizes everything you need to do statics, right? But now you want to do dynamics, right? So what you, what you eventually have to do is you have to go from sort of knowing a static field configuration to somehow now going further in time and seeing, you know, how things evolve in time. So how do we do that? Well, okay, so within the classical, classical field description, right, then each and every single configuration within the ensemble, so for every initial condition, right, the field satisfies the classical equations of motion, right? Uh, and so what are the classical equations of motion here in this context, right? Well, the classical equations of motion are exactly the equations of motion that are derived from that particular lattice discretization that you have chosen, right? Okay, so you have Hamilton's equations of motion, right? dt phi is dh d phi, and dt phi is minus dh d phi. This is just, a, this is just a, the, the usual data function, or the, the normalization of the data function, if you want so, right? Okay, and so you get, uh, so you get essentially equations of motion, right? Which look like the equations of motion in the continuum, except that somehow now, now your, your derivative operator appears as, uh, as discretized. Uh, so also nothing surprising. Uh -huh. Okay, so these are then somehow still continuous equations of motion in time, right? But okay, so generally we don't know how to somehow integrate them forward analytically, let's say, right? So we have to eventually do this numerically, right? And so then in the last step, what one does is one also discretizes the time step now, uh, to obtain a numerical solution, uh, and so as I alluded for, uh, so as I alluded to before previously, is that um, typically one needs a relatively small time step, at least somehow small compared to the compared to the spatial lattice spacing, to actually guarantee stability of the of the of the numerical solution. Uh, and so that's why why one is working in this Hamiltonian formalism in the first place. Uh, and so it turns out that uh, since here one is dealing with uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, there's actually there's actually a particular efficient class of integrator schemes one can use here, which are called symplectic integrators. So in essence, what these do is they, um, they, they, they basically act like canonical transformations on your, on your, on, on your system. Yeah? So you know that, okay, so of course, of course, if you don't have discrete time, then time evolution is essentially canonical transformation. Yeah? And so these, these so-called symplectic integrators are exactly integrators developed for for, um, for Hamil so-called Hamiltonian systems, uh, which uh, have very nice properties when it comes to solving this. Uh, so most commonly what one does is one uses this kind of a leapfrog step, which is actually also the, admittedly the dumbest, I mean, it's also like the simplest thing you could actually do, yeah? but it works very nicely, yeah? uh, where essentially you, you, your field lives, so this, is, so this is somehow different time slices, so your field lives on one time slice, yeah? Um, your momentum field lives on another time slice, and you kind of do mutual commuting updates, uh, where you say, okay, first I update my field to this time slice here, assuming that my momentum field is constant, uh, then I get the field here, and then I do an update of the, of the momentum field, assuming that the conjugate field variable is constant, and then you kind of just iterate these sequential updates until the time uh, when you want to measure. Okay, uh, and so basically you don't have to remember, and you actually, most of the time, you don't even have to remember the earlier configuration, so you can kind of just, after having done a step, you can discard the things down here yeah, and just move on and, and carry onwards in time. Okay, so with that, okay, we now have our initial conditions. We now have to know how to calculate somehow the time evolution, right? So then the last step is, of course, we want to get, we want to measure something, right? We want to know how certain things evolve as a function of time. So how do we do that? Well, we have to calculate our observables, right? And so, okay, uh, so. <laughs> 
the good thing is, okay, we know now somehow know the field as a function of time and space, right? At least on this on this discrete lattice, right? And so basically, all we have to do is, if we have simple observables, we actually just have to plug this in, right? Uh, so, for instance, if we want to measure the order parameter, right? Okay, we just take the field that we have, right? Average it over all the lattice sites, and that's that's our order parameter, right? And so this is really so this is really why this is somehow beautiful, and right? this is an extremely powerful approach, yeah? because you really have access to a lot of observables. Yeah? You can basically calculate arbitrarily complicated uh, observables within this thing very easily, simply because you have the fields at end, right? If you want to calculate the eight or fifteen point function, right? Okay, just multiply your field fifteen times; it's there, right? Okay. Now, okay. So uh, this is this is this is of course not the, not, not quite true. Yeah? Because, uh, I mean, there are also these other more complicated objects that we're actually after, like the spectral function. Huh? And so, so as we said, right, so, this is, so in this classical theory, the spectral function is actually given by the Poisson bracket. Okay? And the Poisson bracket is, Poisson bracket is a, I mean, is a, is, is a functional derivative, right? Uh, so we want to calculate the expectation value of uh, the evolution of somehow a functional derivative. Huh? That's a tough thing to do, right? That's not obvious how to do this, actually. So you could do this actually. Um, so the way you would do this is basically you would have to solve sort of small fluctuations, equations of motions on top of your classical field. So that would be sort of the direct way to do it, uh, because that's at the end of the day what the derivative does. However, it turns out that in this equilibrium context, there's a neat little trick that you can actually exploit to, to, to make your life simple. Huh? And so the trick is that actually you use the fluctuation equation relation. Huh? So as we said, okay, in equilibrium, right, um, the spectral function is related to the, to the statistical two-point correlation function. The statistical two-point correlation function is a simple object, right? That was just a product of fields, right? So that's, again, falls in this category, simple to calculate, right? Just plug in your field and calculate, right? And so what you can do is basically, okay, so you can now somehow multiply this with omega, divide this by t, right? But then omega, and, and then go back to, re, to, the, to the time domain instead, right? So then omega, maps to a, to, a, to a derivative with respect to time times vector of i, which then, or minus i, I guess, here, which then gives this relative minus sign. Yeah? And so you can then basically just calculate the spectral function as a as the time derivative of the statistical two-point correlation function, which, again, is easy to measure. Yeah? And uh, yeah, so the full formula, so you can actually take the derivative even on the on some other operator operatorial level. Yeah? So you basically have to calculate now an unequal time momentum field field correlation function in this particular way. Okay? Yeah? But so essentially all one needs here is, right, so you only just, for this equilibrium system at least, right, you don't only need to calculate somehow equal and unequal time correlation functions of the fields that you have actually presently available. And so this is also why this is somehow a very powerful approach. Huh? Now, okay, so this is perhaps then the very important step, right? So remember, this is not... This is not called classical approximation or classical field time. This is really classical statistics. Yeah? So if I were to do this somehow with a single configuration, right, result I would get would be meaningless. Okay. Yeah? So the important step is then okay. Step four, right? After having done all of this, right, I have to repeat this procedure for all the for for, for all the different initial conditions and now perform statistical averaging, basically repeating all these three steps. Okay. Good. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go and calculate something. So we want to do critical dynamics, right? So first thing you have to do is somehow find the critical point. Okay, and so this is already, so this is already, so perhaps you guys know this, but okay, so, I, uh, and so, so, so we struggled actually with this a little bit. This is why I'm telling this here briefly. How do you actually find the critical point? Yeah? Actually not so easy, yeah? because if you look at some of the size system, yeah? so, Okay, so how would you find the critical point in, the, in somehow the infinite system first, right? You would, okay, so you somehow look at the order parameter, at some point the order parameter would dip to zero, right? And you'd say, aha, this is my critical point here, right? Good. Now you do this in a, so, so you do this in the finite size system, yeah? So instead of somehow having something which dips at some critical point, right, you will always see this, this kind of, uh, <laughs> this kind of, uh, um, <clears throat> well, Things where it actually doesn't completely dip or doesn't completely go to zero, right? And so this is of course uh, this is of course clear, right? Because now you're dealing not with a not with an infinite system or yeah, not really with an infinite system, right? And so I mean the critical divergence of the correlation length near T C is limited, yeah, and therefore somehow 
you're not going to, I mean, you're not really going to see, for instance, this dip here, right? And you always have these kind of finite volume artifacts in your simulations as well. Uh -huh. So you can somehow see, so the different curves here are somehow different lattice sizes, right? So the problem somehow gets, gets a little better as you go to larger and larger lattices and so starts to look more like, more like what you're expecting, right? But I mean, okay, so I mean, if, even if you were to somehow try and try and read off, you know, what's the critical point here, your precision would be somehow larger limited. Yeah? So in two dimensions or so, this is actually okay. Yeah? This is actually, when we first did this, we didn't know how to do this either, right? And so we kind of just went and beat, beat this down by going to really large lattices, but in 3D, this is absolutely impossible. I mean, well, you can do it, but it's, it's also not very smart. Uh -huh. And so actually to, to somehow find this, you actually have to do some better things. Uh, and so typically, what is extremely efficient in actually doing this now is to use these this, this finite size scaling techniques, actually. Uh, so just, just, I mean, perhaps some of, I mean, I guess some of you guys you must know this, actually, but I find this, so I find this useful, yeah? This is why I'm telling about this a little bit. Uh, so how does one do this? Uh, so, okay, so we know that, so let's look at first somehow the scaling relations for an infinite system. So an infinite system, if we introduce somehow this reduced temperature here, right, then we would find that the, the correlation lengths in the infinite system would diverge somehow as a function of the, as a function of the, uh, of the, of the reduced temperature, right? And so likewise, the order parameter would somehow go to zero, yeah? Um, and I can express that in the, uh, well, I can it would go to zero as a function of the reduced temperature, right? But I can also express this in terms of the in terms of the correlation the lengths if I divide out again this exponent here. Yeah? Now the point is that if I look at this in a in a finite size system, right, then there will be correction to that, right? Simply because somehow the correlation lengths in a finite system, right, can somehow not not uh, <laughs> not grow infinite, right? System is finite, right? And so there will be corrections which essentially at lowest order come as a function of the size of the system divided by the correlation lengths in the infinite system, right? Yeah, and so as long as the it's a, so somehow as long as the correlation length is much smaller than much smaller than the system size, this function here should basically be one, right? Yeah, so things should look like in the like in the infinite system, right? But near the critical point, somehow the correlation length diverges, so this will always somehow we will always so close to the critical point, you will always encounter actually these finite volume artifacts. There's, there's simply no way around it, okay? And so then the trick is essentially to say, well, okay, right? So if we have this kind of thing, right? Um, let's multiply our correlation function that we measure on the finite system with this funny factor L to the beta over nu, right? Okay? So what happens then is that, well, okay, I can, I can, I can look what then happens on the right-hand side. Well, on the right-hand side, I then this factor here then also tells to L over Xi S to the beta over nu times this other function which also depends on L over Xi S to the, right? And so, okay, so basically what you find is that if you somehow, if you somehow multiply this with this certain power of the length, right, you will find a universal function of the length times the, or the size of the system times the reduced temperature, right? And so that, is, so, so that thing over here, right, uh, should, uh, it should be a unique function of somehow this combined variable, right? So in a sense, being, uh, being, so, so how does it work? So being further away, uh, being further away on a, being further away from the critical point on a, on a, on a smaller lattice, right? It's like being, uh, being closer to the critical point on a larger lattice. No, must be the opposite way around. Okay, so something like this, right? But so, Okay, so you can basically then, okay, so, so what you can then try to do is, right, you can somehow try to simultaneously determine this critical point, which enters the reduced temperature, right, along with this combination of critical exponents, right? And so if you do this for somehow a variety of observables, right, yeah, what you find is that, okay, you actually get sensitive to the critical exponents, right, as well as the location of the, as well as the location of the, of the critical temperature, right? And so, so if you look, so if you saw this here, right? So here we had all these different somehow, somehow functions that looked very different, right? In fact, they're all describing the same. They're all describing somehow this finite size scaling, yeah? because here this is now somehow the same data, just represented in terms of this finite size scaling variables by multiplying this here, yeah? and then okay, so you can really see, okay, you can you have to force them to overlap, and then you get a nice estimate for somehow where your critical point is here. Uh, and so, really, by doing this for somehow multiple observables, you can then obtain precise estimates of critical temperature and then the exponent sum. Okay, so this is not really this is not really dynamics yet, right? So what we're actually after is dynamics. But okay, I find this 
I, I find this interesting, nevertheless, right? And so let's uh, so, so let's start to familiarize ourselves somehow with with what these objects actually look like. Uh, so I said the object of interest to us here is somehow this uh, this, this spectral function. Uh, and so the first thing we're going to look at is somehow the the case of the high temperature. Now here, in principle. We, I mean, in principle, this is not this is not universal physics, right? So we're really doing a classical computation here, but it's somehow nevertheless useful to somehow get a feeling for what these things look like. Huh? And so the first thing you can do is actually, you can, well, you could in principle calculate this in a in a free theory, right? And so in a free theory, yeah, in the in the time domain, basically what you would get is you would basically just uh, get sinusoidal oscillations of this spectral function, so it would just look like an oscillating sign, yeah. With a with a characteristic frequency which is temperature dependent due to the some other temperature dependence of the effective masses. Uh, now, if you actually look what it what it looks like somehow in the interacting system, then indeed somehow in the high temperature phase here, right? You see you retain these oscillations, right? But the oscillations are now are now damped, right? And so that's really the effect of the of the somehow of the somehow interactions, right? Introducing somehow a finite lifetime of your of your quasi particles. Uh, so likewise, you can map this out in the frequency domain, right? So which is, which is which you see over here. Yeah? Okay. So let's. So in the free theory again, okay. So the, the, the spectral function would be, I mean, take Fourier transform of the sine, right? So you get a get a delta peak, right? So it would be very sharply peaked somehow, right? Yeah. But um, then, okay, as you um, as you go to the interacting theory, uh, what you feel, what you see, are these actually kind of typical sort of bright Wigner-shaped curves, uh, where um, <clears throat> you're still dominated by essentially a quasi-particle peak, right? But uh, okay, you now have a, you, you now somehow have a finite lifetime. And then, so okay, so the, here the green and the red curves. So the green curves are somehow very far away from the critical point, uh, so that's twice the critical temperature. And then, so as you can see, as you're moving in towards the critical point, uh, your excitations get lighter, right? They also start to get somehow slightly uh, slightly broader. Uh, um, yeah, but that's that's basically it. Okay, so now what happens? So, so so the thing we're actually after is somehow what happens in the vicinity of the critical point, right? Because that's that's somehow where the interesting things are, right? And so this is really very interesting, right? So if you compare this somehow away from the critical point, right, you have this you have this sort of propagating behavior, which is which is associated with these damped oscillations, right? But then if you go to the critical, if you go in the vicinity of the critical point here, this actually oppa, sorry, this actually changes quite dramatically, right? Namely, instead of somehow having these having all these wiggles, right? The spectral functions somehow start to complete, look completely different. Right? You have this to some really have a transition to some sort of over damped behavior, where essentially you kind of have this first peak, right, and afterwards you just have sort of a slowish decay, right, and so the time scale for the decay as you approach the critical point eventually becomes larger and larger, and actually starts to develop some of this, this power law divergence. Huh? So you really kind of lose the propagating mode in the system, yeah, and you somehow just get a purely dissipative uh, relaxation of the of, of the order parameters. And this, in principle, you also somehow see in, in in frequency space, where somehow well above the critical point, you had this this sort of uh, quasi-particle peak, and so this is actually you know fit to, to the sort of a bright Wigner function. But then, as you as you go towards T C here, which are somehow then this curve, this curve, and this curve, right? You see, okay, so the quasi-particle becomes lighter, but then there's really the emergence of this, of this somehow, uh, of this somehow uh, diffusive peak, yeah, or actually uh, of this of, of this diffusive peak, and so really you have a change from this somehow relativistic quasi-particle dynamics to the relaxation dynamics, and that's actually what explains, you know, how you get from this mean field exponent of one to actually to actually the critical exponent of two that is uh, that is in this classification. It's really because the dynamics is really just not just not quasi-particles at all. You know? In the vicinity of the critical point. Now you can also so, so from this in principle, then you can also go and somehow try and extract this critical exponent z. And so that's actually I mean that's actually a cool quantity to calculate. I mean it's, it's actually very hard to calculate somehow using is using sort of pen and paper type calculations. But okay, so here you have numerics. You can you can try and do this right. And so as I said right, so so you can well, perhaps first look at this in frequency space. So in frequency space is essentially what should happen is if you if you look at zero momentum this. In principle, should develop somehow power law divergence, and I think we're going to have a fit to this on the next slide. But then you can also somehow Fourier transform this, right? And so, if you Fourier transform this, then you should see that also in the time domain, you should eventually somehow develop power law, which then is given by a combination of critical exponents. 
And the other thing that you can have is that this, that this correlation time, which eventually demarks this kind of a fall of also divergence in the vicinity of the critical point. So you have sort of various knobs to turn. And so you can kind of go and calculate this in, in various different ways. So this, by the way, is, so, so this is now the, really the, the, the spectral function at what we believe to be somehow the critical point, right? And so, this, so there you really see it very nicely, right? So you have this, this kind of smallish remnant of the quasi particle over here, right? But then you have this huge infrared power law, yeah, which, is, which is related to the critical behavior. And so you can actually really beautifully fit a power law and extract these, these, these critical exponents, um, which then actually turns out to be, you know, well, you get, you get relatively large errors, right? So you get something like 2 plus minus 0.15 or something like this. But this is then consistent, really, with, with what you find in these classification schemes. Yeah? And it's, it's really due to this, this change of dynamics that is going on. Yeah? So, okay, so there was two reasons for kind of showing you this data. Uh, this is showing the study, right? So the one was, of course, to somehow familiarize ourselves with, with somehow the, what is the technology that we're using here to, to, to study dynamics real-time dynamics, right? But the other one was also to show you that oftentimes somehow, you know, these, these classical field techniques, yeah, they're used in the context of recoupling studies and so forth, right? But here, I really one is studying somehow very strongly correlated systems, right? I mean, this is very, very non-trivial what you, what you find here in terms, of the, in terms of the behavior of the spectral function. It's really not just somehow weakly interacting gossip particles, but you can really do amazing dynamics with this kind of things as well, okay? Good. Any questions on this? Yes. Previous slide you showed two, uh, one uh, in frequency space and the other in real time. So how does this IT tau reflect on the Fourier space, uh, this exponential behavior? That uh, good question. be a pole I mean, like yeah I mean so, so I mean this is the Fourier transform of this basically right so this should be I mean this should be essentially act like a cutoff somehow here yeah but you you don't really whoop. is the mic working somehow I, yeah okay okay so my ear that's weird okay. so if typically if you have a zyt it's like a pole and and uh, exponential and so this should be a ah but we're only studying it on the real frequency line right this is on the real frequency axis, right? We're not yeah, yeah, yeah. out in the complex plane. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, but you, but if you Fourier transform, yeah, yeah, you yeah. could you you could try and do that too. Yeah. Um, I mean, good question. I don't I don't know the answer to that. I mean, yeah. Okay. More questions? No. Okay. Good. So then. Then let's carry on. Okay, let's, let, let me perhaps skip this part, or let me just mention it, mention it briefly in words, right? So, okay, so, so this was somehow a purely equilibrium study, right, that uh, we had actually done a long time ago. Um, but okay, so, so, so actually you, you, you can even go slightly beyond that, right? And so that's actually quite interesting in, uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. Huh? So, you, so, so what you can now also try and do is you can, you can try to somehow not place the system in equilibrium at the critical point, but kind of shoot it by the critical point a little bit, right? So you somehow, and the way to do this is of course to somehow dynamically change the parameters like the temperature in your system, right? As you bypass the critical point. Uh, and so in principle, right? So this is kind of a sketch of how you would do this in this, in this, in this five to the fourth theory, say for instance, right? In principle, this is exactly the kind of, uh, the kind of situation that we encounter in, uh, in, in heavy ion collisions when we're searching for the critical point, right? So here you see some of our, what we believe to be our picture of the QCD phase diagram, right? And so you can, you can kind of, uh, I mean, in experience, we also shoot by the critical point for some of finite time, right? And so we, this is, this is really is something that we need to understand and necessarily figure out what happens there. Uh -huh. So in principle, again, uh, if, if it's a, so if the decoupling of this, so, so what will happen there? Yeah? So the point is that because of near the critical point, uh, Somehow these relaxation times diverge, uh, so the system somehow takes really an infinite amount of time to sort of fall back into equilibrium. It will necessarily fall out of equilibrium somewhere in the vicinity of the critical point. Uh, and so this is something that one really needs to understand if we if we want to if we if we want to search for the critical point in heavy ion collisions. Uh. 
And so there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of interesting work being done on this. I mean, going, going back to some of the early 2000s or so, perhaps even earlier, yeah, yeah. But so, I mean, what I would basically just like to highlight here is somehow the possibility to actually benchmark these critical point searches, which this guy, we, with these simple kind of studies in well, essentially Ising model like systems, yeah. And so, the, turns out this is something you can actually do, right, within, within this approach as well. Essentially, what you have to do is you have to now somehow can no longer consider the conservative Hamiltonian dynamics, but what you have to do is you have to add somehow a coupling to a heat bath that allows you to somehow dynamically change the temperature of the system as a function of time. Yeah? So instead of somehow looking at Hamiltonian, the Hamilton's equations of motion, what you have to do is um, uh, you, you can you can add a coupling to a heat bath, yeah, which you do by somehow damping the momentum, but then also somehow adding a noise term, yeah, which again feeds back energy into the system, yeah, and then you can somehow study different trajectories in the phase diagram. And so I mean, this is something we kind of started, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so, but it's, it's surprising actually how rich the dynamics is there in the, in, in the vicinity of this, in the vicinity of this, uh, of this critical point and really how much it depends on sort of what the detailed shape of the trajectory is that you take in the phase diagram. Huh? So for example, I draw here to sort of two arrows here huh, where you can, you can somehow go through the critical point. Right? And so, um, so, so the associated plots are down here as to, as to what the evolution of the order parameter looks like. Huh? So what one is doing here is when someone starts from the high temperature phase, right? And then sort of changes the temperature as a function of time, eventually passing by the critical point. Huh? And so the black curves here somehow show the equilibrium result for the order parameter and then sort of different quenching rates going somehow from, from, uh, for, from very slow to very fast. Uh. And so you can see that if you, if you start to start, uh, and fall out of the, I mean, you actually remain uh, sort of out of equilibrium for, for, for a relatively long time out here. Uh. Um, but then it also depends very much on where you are. Yeah? For instance, if you quench directly on this phase coexistence line, you actually find all kinds of interesting phenomena where essentially, where essentially it can happen that somehow the system falls into, into, in, into one of these, into essentially different, different symmetry broken phases into different regions in space, and then there's sort of a competition of ordering these domains, yeah? and so all of this very interesting, you can do beautiful pictures with this. Yeah? Whereas for instance, if you actually have an isolated phase, then somehow if you actually, Quench, I mean, if you actually do the quench into, in, in a regime where you have a single, single out minimum, yeah, then somehow these non-equilibrium effects that you get are somewhat less pronounced. Yeah? So there, but this is sort of just as a, as sort of an appetizer, yeah, just to show you that also in the context of these, uh, of these equilibrium systems, you can actually do interesting things. Okay, so, yes, a question. Uh, because you don't need it. Uh, this actually, well, uh, good question actually. This is, I mean, in this, so, so, so what we've always found is that in the vicinity of the critical point, all of this is surprisingly insensitive to the, to the, to the choice of the noise. Yeah? Uh, which, I mean, is, to a certain extent is what you expect if the dynamics is universal, right? I mean, it should also shouldn't depend on how you, somehow how you couple it to the other degrees of freedom, right? I mean, of course, if you look at somehow ultraviolet quantities or so, then that's where it will depend on the noise, right? But if you look at these, some of these macroscopic things, then that's essentially one way for you to check that what you're calculating is really, is really dominated by somehow universal physics and not the, not the microscopics that you put in. Uh, I mean, it seems like near the TC as you go, uh, the, collect the collective excitations of the sim uh, system are becoming more and more important. So, uh, I mean, traditionally, what at, at least in QGP, because you mentioned it in your last slide, people calculate all these transport coefficients, mm -hmm. and and the all the entire approach is bound to break down near uh, your TC. Then, because uh, your collective ex excitations are becoming important, however, you are when you are uh, getting the kinetic transport coefficients from kinetic theory, you are just looking at the two point, two particle interactions kind of thing. So then, I mean, one should revisit those things. Then, I mean, yeah. So, so I mean, so, so near the critical point, you have to be careful with all these things, right? I mean, for instance, certain. I mean, depending on what. I mean, depending on what. What detail of this uh, of this dynamical universality class you're in, for instance, you will find divergences in certain transport coefficients and so forth. And this I, this is exactly related to these to these divergences in, for instance, the two point functions that you see. Yeah? 
But yeah, yeah because, I, mean, the, uh, I mean, the dynamics is really different than somehow it is somewhere else. Yeah. yeah, because Raju was also pointing it out, like eta by s depends on your T relax, tau relaxation by the system uh, interaction. And somehow it was not, uh, it was way off. The relaxation time approximation was way off the time which was required to give you the small eta s that you observe. So uh, it, it just sort of does not bring the entire formalism in a question. Like it's not valid and we are still using it, seems like. I'm, I, so I'm not sure what exactly what you mean, but perhaps we can, we, we can, we, we can take this offline. This so, I mean, okay, so essentially it's like it's if in, in uh, from statistical mechanics, thermodynamics point of view, so BBGKY hierarchy, so higher order uh, becomes more important. So you you are while you are just sticking to the first order. No, I'm, I, I mean I'm not sticking to any order here. Right? Not you, not you. Yeah, I mean yeah, not you. When yeah, no, when, no, no, when, I, I agree. I agree. I mean you have to. I mean, it's, I mean it's very. This is what I said also, right? I mean it's very non-trivial, for instance, to calculate a critical exponent like z or so, right? From say a diagrammatic approach or so. It's actually very challenging. You need you necessarily need uh, need resummations to to actually get not just not just get needed results also. Yeah. It's, so it's very, yeah, it, 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 I agree, it's a difficult task. Point is not about what he's doing. My point is about if we take a message from his discussion, uh, then what generally people do when, we, when they discuss uh, viscosity or transport coefficient in context of QC. So you have entire viscous hydro which is built on this paradigm where you are just confining yourself to the lowest order in BBG. No, no, but this is, no, 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 so, so this is not true actually, right? So I mean hydrodynamics is just a macroscopic description. I mean that's not, that, that doesn't require, the, 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 I mean the present, the existence of a quasi-particle interpretation or anything like this, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean strongly coupled systems actually are, <laughs> are, are, among, are, are among the most perfect fluids we know, right? Yeah, so, so that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, somehow the dynamics is weakly coupled or something like this. Actually, on the contrary, right? I mean, actually, weakly coupled systems are typically very imperfect fluids. Uh, uh. Okay, good. So, okay, so that's, uh, so, 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 so that's it for somehow this, uh, for somehow this little example, right? So, um, but so far we've only done somehow in equilibrium or somehow universal dynamics, right? So, okay, so we, last time we developed some of this whole, this whole techniques and then familiarized ourselves with all these non-equilibrium path integrals, right? But we've only used them for some other trivial case, right? Where we exploited actually universality to somehow say that the approach should be justifiable, right? Now, really what we have in mind of doing is, right, we want to actually do non-equilibrium physics and we want to do actually non-equilibrium physics in QCD, right? But, okay, somehow before we can meaningfully do anything, right, we should, uh, we should uh, somehow figure on out what is the range of applicability of this deep approach that we have and what are the corrections to this classical statistic, okay? And so if you remember what we did last time, right, then we somehow wrote down generating functionals or calculation observable in a, in, in, in a quantum field theory, right? And so we, we wrote this as this path integral on the, on the schwinger keldisch contour, right? Where um, initially we somehow had sort of a forward-going branch and a backward-going branch, right? But then we found to somehow isolate the classical features. It was, it was somehow better to switch to essentially the sum variable phi, which was sort of the average between the upper and lower contour, and this difference variable chi, right, which was somehow, in a sense, characterizing quantum fluctuations, okay, that's, let's call it the quantum field, okay, and so then, so, 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 so then the point was that, okay, how did we recover the classical, uh, how did we get this classical statistical approximation, right, well, okay, we looked at the part that was generating dynamics, which was the difference in action between the upper part of the contour and the lower part of the contour, okay, and so we found that, Okay, we could essentially expand this in the power series of this, of, this, of this field guy, right? And so to leading order, what we found is that, okay, there's just the classical equation of motion multiplied by this field, this constraint, I mean, this quantum field guy, right? 
And then there's an additional correction, which is of order chi cubed, multiplying the classical field, uh, which in the classical statistical approximation is neglected because it is of order h bar squared. Okay? So that, and then that is essentially how we had motivated the approximation so far, right? So we can certainly say, okay, corrections are of order h bar squared, but this is somehow not a meaningful statement, right? I mean, h bar is not a free parameter that we can do, right? I mean, it's just is what it is, right? So we somehow have to understand on, 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 on more general grounds what is going on, right? And okay, so we will just set h bar to one from now on, okay? Good, so for this, okay, so, so now let's try to understand what is going on, right? And so for this, um, what we should do is we should first, well, we should look at somehow what is the nature of these corrections, okay? And so for that, it's actually useful to somehow split our theory as we would do usually, right, into or as we would do in, say, weak couple, weakly coupled approaches, into sort of the, uh, the, the free parts and the interacting parts, right? So the free parts, as usual, are the parts which are quadratic in the field, right? So this would be this xi del squared phi plus m squared phi, right? And then the interaction part would encompass this, this thing here, right? So the phi cubed times xi, but also the xi cubed times phi, right? And so the first thing that we actually find in doing this is so, if we look at the, at the free part and for the moment neglect the interaction parts, is right, that in the free part, actually, this quantum field is only linear, right? So that is the part that is included in, the, in what, we, what we call the classical approximation, right? And so the classical statistical approximation is actually exact for free theory, okay? So that is, that, 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 that may seem somehow surprising at first sight, right? Because if you think, think for instance, about, say, okay, so, so, so say you think, of, for instance, about a harmonic oscillator, right? That's a free theory, okay? All right? So then I'm telling you here that the, that the dynamics of the harmonic oscillator is actually classic. And that's a true statement, right? However, it turns out that, I mean, we also think that the quantum harmonic oscillator is somehow not just a classical oscillator, and that's also true, right? And, but, that does, uh, but that information is then encoded, for instance, in the Wigner function representing the initial state, or the Wigner transform of the observables that we would measure in the quantum field, right? But the dynamics of the system itself, or the dynamics of any free theory, is actually classical by itself, classical in nature, in the sense that you can write it as a sort of a sum of classical trajectories. The fluctuation dissipation relation is different. So you want to do now, what do you want to do? You want to do a free, a free theory in equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, but okay, I mean, they, I mean, that would be a property of the initial state, essentially, right? That's the, I mean, that's the way I'm phrasing it here, right? The point is that, I mean, you, you, I mean, I mean you have a period there's no loophole to this argument, right? I mean, the periodicity of a time circle does depend on h bar. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah, 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 of course, I'm not arguing with this, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it, I mean, this is why I pointed this out, right? There can be quantum corrections to the state that you're in and to the observables that you're measuring, and that's precisely then how you get this, right? But if you have a non-interacting theory, then then the dynamics is somehow intrinsically classical. Huh? Quantum optics is different from classical optics. Okay. So. Okay, so, so, so that's certainly, certainly a very interesting piece of information, right? But that's okay, that's, that's not really what we want, right? Because I mean, free field, the free field theories also don't have very interesting dynamics, right? And we want to study interacting field theories, right? So let's try to understand uh, somehow, uh, somehow the interacting field theories, right? And so for that, of course, we have to now look at the interaction corrections to discuss. And so what are the interaction corrections? So this collects all terms which are, which are somehow not quadratic in the fields, right? And so out of these, out of these, okay, we have essentially this term over here and the term that we neglect, okay? Yeah. So well, this is written again here, right? So we have essentially, if you want to phrase it in the, in the formulation of diagrams, right? Then we essentially have sort of two types of vertices, right? To which we can attach field lines, right? On the one hand, we have this vertex that is included in the classical statistical approximation, to which we attach somehow four of these five fields, uh, three of these five fields and one of these one of these chi fields, right? And on the other hand, we have this somehow this quantum vertex, right? Which uh, which uh, to which we attach only one phi field, but now three chi fields. Uh -huh. And so, okay, so there's two things that we learned from this, right? So the one, and I think I've mentioned this before, is that 
this classical statistical approximation is actually, it, it's not a perturbative approach, really. I mean, it's non-perturbative in the sense that it's somehow taking into account all orders of this classical vertex, right? But, okay, it also neglects any order of this quantum vertex, right? And so really the nature of the expansion to a certain sense is that we are somehow assuming that, uh, we, we are somehow assuming that this, this quantum field chi, right, should be much smaller than this classical field phi that we're dealing with, right? Okay, so now, so, so really, yeah, so, so in a sense, so in a certain sense, you could say it's an expansion, it's somehow absolute value of chi over absolute value of phi, right? Now, okay, so of course, at this present stage, this is somehow not, this is somehow not, not a very meaningful statement, right? Because, okay, I mean, these are both fields that are being integrated over, right? And so I cannot really say, okay, one is much smaller than the other, okay? Uh -huh. So to actually make that statement somehow meaningful, right, what really one has to consider is now one has to consider somehow expectation values of these different fields, right, and, uh, and yes? So you are neglecting chi in terms of phi, that's, that's right, but there's also another thing that if you're doing it about equilibrium, starting, you usually impose this uh, periodicity in K in the schwinger keldish contour, Mm -hmm. But this is proportional to h-bar. So somehow when you go to a classical approximation, you have to also take the limit h-bar. No, but this, I mean, this, this one in principle terms I keep, right? So, so let's go back, right? So if you go all the way back, right? Yeah, so this, this is in principle part of this Wigner transform of the initial condition, right? So if you have a quadratic theory, then essentially then essentially this, uh, essentially this is gone, this is gone, and the rest is exact up to this stage. Ah, so each part. So, so, it's, it's, so it's part of this complicated thing here. Yeah? And so my feeling is what will happen is actually that, that this will be non-positive, semi-definite, and so forth. And then in, in, in somehow in, in, in a very intricate way you recover this at the end of the day. It will be interesting to work out actually, but... I mean, on the level of formal manipulations, there's nothing that's... That's happened there. I mean, one should sit down and work it out. I agree. It's a very, it's a very interesting question, actually, how it happens for 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 free, 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 free theory. I've never thought about it. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so. So okay, so we have the classical and the quantum vertex, right? And so really, what we so, so what we learn from this analysis, right? I mean, so it's, a, so it's an expansion in somehow powers of the quantum field, right, over powers of the classical field, okay, right? But this statement is not meaningful under the integral, so we can only make somehow a statement at the level of uh, correlation function, right? Uh -huh. So what, what do I mean by this? Well, I mean. So imagine now we are kind of starting to expand out these exponentials, for instance, right? And what would appear would be somehow different contractions, right? So there would be, for instance, a phi phi correlation function appearing, a phi chi correlation function appearing, somehow connecting these vertices, right? And so that's, so that's a level at which we can then somehow start to make the comparison and start to analyze actually what we're keeping and what we're throwing away, okay? So, of course, uh, so yeah, exactly, right? So what we need to do is we need to somehow analyze this more carefully in terms of the correlation functions, right? And so, um, so, so, so let's look back at somehow what, what, what are these correlation functions, right? So the first thing to recall here is that, okay, so in order to, to, to construct this path integral, right, we somehow had to always consider these contour time ordered correlation functions, right? And um, okay, so now we can we, we, we can we, we can look at what these are essentially. And so let's first look at the level of the one point function, right? So this is naturally how you start, right? Principally, you have to establish this somehow for for all the correlation functions, but you start with the simplest one, which is the one point. Okay. Okay. So here I'm kind of doing this. So let's do this in the fly, first in the plus minus basis because there it's it's really easier to see, right? Because there you have this this time ordering, and then in between you have this somehow funny change of variables, right? And so, okay, so the expectation value of this sort of phi plus field, right? Well, okay, this is a one-point function. There's nothing fancy about operator ordering, so that's just the, so that's just the expectation value of our Heisenberg field operator at a given position in time, okay? Right? So the same is, of course, true for the, for the field on the upper branch, on the lower branch of the contour, right? Uh, so that maps onto the same expectation value, right? Uh, and so therefore, if I now do the change of variables into, these, into the average and the difference fields, right, is what we'll find is that, okay, 
the average field is actually what gives us the expectation value of the field operator. And so I'm going to denote this as phi in the, in, in the upcoming few slides, right? Whereas the expectation value of this, uh, of, of this quantum field or this difference field, right, actually vanishes identically, right? And so, okay, so this quote unquote classicality condition that one is much smaller than the other is clearly always met at the level of these one point, right? Okay, but that's essentially just a symmetry constraint that we have. Uh, I mean, that's just a manifestation of symmetry, actually, between, uh, <laughs> between upper branch and lower branch. Okay, so, but this is already good, right? So this already means that, okay, it doesn't fail right away somehow, right? But okay, so let's, <laughs> let's go to somehow the next non-trivial order, right? And so the next non-trivial order would, would be then to, to, to somehow now start looking at uh, a, a two-point correlation function, and that's a, that's a question I think you asked during the last lecture, is uh, what do these look like? Okay, so now we can have, now we have four possibilities, right? In the, first in the, in the, in the plus plus, and uh, in, in this plus minus basis, right? So if both fields are on the upper branch of the contour, right, then they are simply, then we're going forward in time, so they're simply time-ordered, right? Okay, so you have the time-ordered product of field operators, and you can write this out explicitly in data functions if you wish. Yeah, there's probably a bunch of typos here that you can find, but okay. Good. Okay, if both of the fields are on the lower branch of the contour, then okay, this contour is going backward in time, so you have anti-time ordering, okay? Yeah. So you have anti-time ordered product of field operators there, and okay, you can again spell this out explicitly. Yeah? Okay, now what happens if one field is on the upper branch and the other one is on the lower branch? Yeah. So, so then, so, okay, so I think, so I think, <laughs> yeah, 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 so I think I, I heard it from that. So then, okay, the, then we know we have a definite, so then actually we have a definite operator ordering, right? Because, okay, the contour is going like this, right? So I first go, have to go here, and then I have to go here, right? So the operator ordering is always that this one comes first, this one comes after, right? And so that's if, if we look at this plus minus correlation function, and the plus is to the right, and the minus is to the left, right? And vice versa, if we look at minus plus, then it's just the other way around, okay? Good. Okay, so now, okay, so we get all this mess here, right? Okay, but okay, so generally, as we said, there are only two independent correlation functions. You can choose whatever basis you please, right? So common choices are either these Whiteman functions, but we're going to use our, our old little friends here that we're already familiar with, right? Namely, the statistical and the spectral function, right? Because there we already have now developed some our understanding for what these things mean, at least in equilibrium systems, okay? Okay, so... Okay, this is not really what we're after, right? We want to compare somehow phi phi, phi chi, and so forth, these guys, right? So, like correlation functions of classical and quantum fields, right? So, what we have to do is we have to now do our change of variables, right? Okay, so you have to take basically this result here, yeah, and essentially just do the change of variables on each of them, yeah? and so it's not too difficult to work this out. Yeah? So, under the change of variables, what these, what these map to is essentially the following. Yeah? So the two-point correlation function of this, of this classical field maps to the statistical correlation function yeah, plus the disconnected part, which is just the expectation value of the, of the microscopic expectation value of the field, right? whereas phi chi maps to the retarded propagator, chi, pi, chi phi maps to the advanced propagator, and actually turns out that chi chi, yeah, so the two-point correlation function of this quantum field, actually vanishes identically simply because all the terms can't. Uh, uh, and so these retarded and advanced correlators, they're again, uh, I mean, they are just, they're again, so, so you, can, you can work out what these are, so they're just, again, related to the commutator with a, with a theta function up front. That's essentially just their definition, right? So they are, so both of these are, again, related to the spectrum. Now, what does this tell us in terms of, uh, in terms of what we want to understand? Maybe what we understand, want to understand is somehow this classicality condition. Yeah. Um, well, it means that uh, it means that uh, for somehow typical contractions of chi being less than typical contractions of phi, what we need is that essentially these two guys here, right, are somehow much smaller than whatever we have here, where we have two classical fields present, right. And so really the classicality criterion is that somehow 
the statistical two-point function uh, plus some more field expectation value is actually much larger than the spectral function. Uh, and so that is a statement that equipped with, uh, with what, we, what we discussed before, we can actually somewhat understand. Uh, so what does this mean in practice? Well, well I should have asked you the question. Let's flip back. <laughs> so what does this mean now? Anyone? Let's start the other way. What does the spectral function describe? So spectral function somehow gives us sort of the possible states in the system, right? What does the what, what does the statistical two-point function give us? Is what? You said that that basically represent fluctuations. So, is it like that we need fluctuations to overcome this spectral function thing? Right. So, 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 so in essence, it's like that, right? We need either strong, either large fluctuations in the system or strong classical fields, right? And so, I mean, you can you, you can sort of make this make this a little more quantitative, right? If you if you wish, right? So, okay, I mean, so the statistical function, as we discussed, right, describes somehow the actual excitations which are present in the system, right? Whereas the spectral dysfunction sort of just gives us which excitation modes are actually possible, right? And so, as we said, right, okay, in thermal equilibrium, they're related by essentially this thermal occupancy effect, right? Now. If this is supposed to be much, much larger than this, right, what that means is that really what you need is you somehow need a high occupancy, right, of each of your quantum states, right? So each of the some other possible states, right, should be highly occupied. Huh? And so this is really now somehow what is the, what is if you want, so the expansion parameter in the classical, in, the, in this classical statistical theory. Yeah? You're essentially expanding in one over, one over occupation number of the, of somehow your, your, your characteristic states. Yeah? Or another way of saying this is somehow the classical statistical description. When is it actually accurate? Well, it's accurate in the presence of either having very strong fields, right? Because then you're kind of dominated by this term in the expansion. Or if you have somehow very high occupancy of your bosonic states, yeah, uh, and okay, I mean that's that's something that we kind of have. I mean this is also what our intuition tells us, right? I mean in, in in essence this is nothing, this is nothing else than somehow the correspondence principle, right? Which tells you if you somehow look at a quantum state it's, <laughs> or very high occupancy, then this should have this should have classical features, uh -huh. and so so okay, so this. Well, perhaps this may seem as sort of a sort of very narrow range of applicability or very very specialized circumstance. Uh, it turns out that actually there's a lot of interesting problems which are precisely of this nature, uh, as they appear in QCD, cosmology, and coal atoms. Uh, um, for instance, Raju already mentioned some examples like this, and we're gonna we're gonna deal with more of them over here. Uh, now, there's another thing that I want to point out as we're, as we're somehow discussing this now, right, is that if you look at actually this criterion, right, so this, I mean, the way I've written this, this is, oh, okay, this is, of, this is of course what in principle should be satisfied, right, but this is also incredibly general, right, I mean, this depends on like six arguments, okay, right, this cannot ever be possibly be true for all of these arguments, right, at least not over somehow their full range, right. And so, really, what it means, so, 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 so one of the particular aspects of that is that if you actually look at this sort of classical key criterion, right, then this is something that also depends on time, right? So, it may be that at a certain instant of time, right, your system is very strong, very highly occupied, right, and you may think, well, okay, this should be a, this should be a fantastic idea to somehow describe this semi classic okay? But what will typically happen is that over time, this will actually change, right, and eventually your approximation can break down. Okay, and so that's always something that one should keep in mind when somehow using these kind of techniques. Okay, are there questions on this uh, on this formal part? Okay, I don't see any. So then, uh, 
And I think what comes next, yes, so then what comes next is now sort of our, our, our first, uh, first, uh, first example of sort of non-equilibrium physics. And um, essentially what we're going to be looking at is, uh, is thermalization of a scalar field. Uh, um, now you may wonder, okay, so on the one hand, this is a great, this is somehow a great toy problem to study and sort of getting to the, getting to the level of, of, of actually studying gauge theories, right? Particularly because some of the formalism is a lot easier and everything. Um, the other thing is that this actually plays a role in, in uh, interestingly, this plays a role in cosmology. And so, so the so particular example that I'm going to be showing here is actually taken from a study that was uh, originally performed in, 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 cos in cosmology. So, okay, so let's uh, somehow look a little, little bit more detail in this, in this picture that I showed earlier. Huh? And so, where this plays a role is this, is, is, is in this period, which I, I believe is somehow related to this bending over here, yeah, which is called reheating after, in, uh, reheating after inflation. So, so, so what happens there is that somehow during inflation, uh -huh, um, what you need is somehow, you need an accelerated expansion of the universe to, to, to create inflation, right? And so for this, you actually need a negative pressure, yeah? And so this is, this is often realized in these models to introduction of scalar fields, yeah? Because if for a scalar field, the pressure is, is the negative of its potential, yeah? So if you have a scalar field which has a large potential energy but a very small kinetic energy, then this will have a huge negative pressure, yeah? And so, okay. We don't really know what the scalar field is, right? I mean, we're operating here at scales which are so high that we have no idea in principle what the, what, what the, what the actual particle content should be there, right? So there's, so there's naturally a variety of models that you could study this. Huh? Um, so, which of course makes, makes the story very difficult to, to, to really address in practice, right? But okay, but you can certainly aim for us to somehow find generic features between different models and, and things like that. What we will do here is we will focus on the, absolutely simplest model <laughs> that there is, uh, which is uh, where this is realized through a single scalar field, okay, single component scalar field. Uh -huh. And so in principle, this is, okay, so in principle, this is, this is still a very difficult problem because, in, because, okay, as I said, right, okay, you're actually using this scalar field to realize a certain cosmological expansion dynamics, right? And so in principle, you kind of have to solve for the two things self-consistently. Uh, uh -huh. um, However, this is typically actually not what people do. Uh, um, I mean, there's, there is people doing this, of course, but um, it's not what we're going to do here. So we're, we're going to instead make our life simple. But I'm going give to you, give you sort of a brief, brief sketch of why this is still uh, at least roughly relevant to this, uh, to this problem in, that, that you're facing in cosmology. So usually in cosmology, right, so you have to, okay, in principle, you would have to somehow solve, um, <clears throat> solve simultaneously for the metric and the evolution of the scalar field, right? So you'd actually have to somehow introduce your scalar field in a, in a, in a, in a, in a general space time. But then, okay, if you make the assumption that somehow on the, the usual cosmological assumption that somehow your space time is homogeneous and isotropic, right? You can go to this friedman robertson walker metric where you sort of have a diagonal, diagonal matrix, which is just described by a, by a scale factor A. Yeah? And so what you will find is that then essentially the scalar field uh, equation of motion essentially features one additional damping term, yeah, which is called this, this sort of Hubble damping, yeah, um, which basically means that, okay, if you expand the universe, your field also has to go down somehow to, 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 to conserve energy. Yeah. Um, now, it turns out that actually if you're, that, uh, that actually you can, you can do a scale transformation in this system, yeah, so you can just do simple remapping of of time, space, and field coordinates, right? By which you can somehow bring your field equation of motion into sort of a more convenient form that looks much more like what we're used to. Huh? And in particular, if you, those are the only terms which are somehow really explicitly related to, to the expansion dynamics of the universe then appear here in, as a prefactor of this mass term. And there's one term which is, which is describing, which is actually describing the expansion dynamics itself. Huh? But okay, so now if you assume that your field is actually massless, then this first term goes away. Uh, and if in addition you make the assumption that by somehow by the time that this, skill, the, the, this, the, this field needs to thermalize, the universe is already dominated by radiation. Uh, so then you'll actually find that this, that this, um, that this second derivative with respect to eta of the scale factor will also vanish. Uh, and then you're basically back to somehow just studying 
normalization of a scalar field theory in a fixed box. Uh, so you've basically absorbed the full expansion dynamics into, uh, into just the rescaling of your fields in this case. Uh, and so that's the example that we're gonna, that we're gonna be looking at. Uh. Okay, so now in principle, we did, now we're talking about a, again, single component scalar field, right? And so already had today this example of uh, equilibrium critical dynamics. So this is certainly something that we, that we now know how to do, right? And so the only thing that changes when now switching to non-equilibrium systems is the initial conditions, of course, right? And so what are the initial conditions in this case? And so as I told you somehow, you know, I mean, to, 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 to realize, this, uh, this, to realize this, this period of inflation, yeah, um, you, you need to essentially to sit there, I mean, need the scalar field, uh, this is the inflaton field, yeah, to have a large potential energy. So typically, this is someone sitting here, say, on the on 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 top of its, its potential. Yeah, that's you know, we call hilltop inflation, I think. Yeah, and then, so what happens is that at the end of inflation, this thing will start to roll down. Yeah? So, okay. So what does this mean in terms of our initial conditions? Well, our initial conditions are described in terms of a large, homogeneous inflaton field. Yeah? So that's this field which is driving inflation and which is sort of constant across essentially the entire range of the universe, right? Okay. Um, initially, it's rolling very slowly, so you can approximate its initial speed by zero, essentially, right? But then that's not somehow not the full story, right? Because, okay, so say I just had a classical homogeneous field, right? I solve classical equations of motion, right? Then the full system would classically, and classically it would remain homogeneous the entire time, right? Uh, every derivative acting on my field just gives me zero, right? So I'm, I'm never going to create sort of, a, sort of a, sort of a spectrum of uh, modes there. Uh -huh. And so it turns out, so, so this is actually one of these, so, so this is actually one of these uh, kind of a problems, right? Where even though the dynamics is classical, there are essentially quantum aspects entering now to the, now to the introduction of this Wigner function, right? Which tells us, well, okay, there cannot just be like a homogeneous field in space. There's got to be fluctuations around these, and these are quantum fluctuations, okay? Uh -huh. And so it turns out that actually, so, so, so the typical models here that one considers, uh, they're extremely weakly coupled. Uh, so I think so I took this from, uh, I'm, I'm going to have the reference down there, but they're coupling with something like 10 to the minus 8 or so, right? So this is like dreamland for people doing QCD. Uh -huh. um, and so, okay, I mean, in this case, you, could, you can, of course, calculate somehow this Wigner function of the vacuum perturbatively, right? So that should be a very good approximation, right? And so then, okay, so then that's basically like, I mean, that's essentially like the ground state of a harmonic oscillator. So you basically have, uh, you basically have Gaussian fluctuations uh, for uh, both the fields and its, and its time derivatives. Uh, so, okay, so this is, this is the spectrum of fluctuations that you... So different Fourier modes are uncorrelated uh, in, 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 in the perturbative calculation. Uh, and so you just have uh, Gaussian fluctuations of both the fields and their conjugate momentum field. Uh. Okay, so eta here is always time, right? So this is this conformal term. I just, I just used this here, okay? Good. So initial conditions are different, right? Everything else is now the same. So question is now, okay, so, so what is the, actually the question, right? I mean, in principle, the question that we want to understand is how do we go from this state, right, where we just have somehow this, this huge initial field, right, to something that actually looks like our universe, okay, right? So in principle, what you would in principle like to understand is you know how all the standard module particles and so forth are produced. Huh? But okay, so then again, you would have to, to, couple, to know how to couples to the, to the standard model. So we're going to ask the simpler question of actually how the scalar field actually thermalizes, okay? And so for this, it's important to, it is important to point out that this initial state that we're looking at uh, of just having this huge homogeneous field and some of small fluctuations around it is actually very far from equilibrium, okay? And so why is it very far from equilibrium? Well, it's, I mean, you, you, you can kind of see it in, in, in a couple of different ways. So basically the point is that um, essentially if you want so this sort of the typical coherence lengths of the uh, of fluctuations in the system is very different than the sort of the typical coherence lengths of fluctuations of the of the system that you have in an equilibrium system. Uh -huh. So okay, so how do we how, how can we characterize this? So in the initial state, right? So we're dominated somehow by the energy density of the 
uh, by the potential energy density of the scalar field, right? So that's lambda phi zero to the four, okay? Uh, whereas in thermal equilibrium, the energy density is what I mean for this theory is something like pi squared over 30 uh, t, t to the four, okay? Right? So it goes like t to the four, okay? Uh, now, initially, the coherent length uh, is the entire system size because we have somehow this huge macroscopic field there, right, which is, which is homogeneous across the whole space, right, whereas somehow the typical coherence length of, of fluctuations in the thermal system is, is the inverse of the temperature, right? So that's somehow the typical wavelength of, of fluctuations in the system. Uh -huh. Okay, and so now the nice thing is that, okay, so we said, okay, we, have, we can basically map this problem in the expanding universe to, to thermalization in a static box, right? But we know that in a static box, the energy density is conserved throughout the thermalization process, right? So these two have to be equal, right? And so that allows us to actually determine the equilibrium temperature, right? So the equilibrium temperature is then something like lambda to the one quarter times this initial, initial field, right? But this initial field is actually large. It's actually non-perturbatively large. Uh, so the initial field in principle scales like the inverse square root of the coupling to be actually somewhere at the top of the potential. Yeah? And so what you can, so you can plug this back in, uh, determine some of what this, what this coherence length is. Uh, so the coherence length comes out to be this beast, uh, but the important point is that somehow the coherence length is much, much less than, of course, the full system size, right? And so here's sort of a visual way to do this. Yeah? So this is actually, these are kind of eigenmodal simulations here, right? So, okay, so I mean, in the initial state, right, we kind of have this huge field spanning the entire space, right? Whereas in thermal equilibrium, we somehow have all these sort of short range fluctuations, right? And so really what somehow has to happen during this thermalization process is that the energy that's initially inside this homogeneous field, right, has to be transferred from this long wavelength excitation, right, to these much, much shorter wavelength excitations that are there in equilibrium, right? Uh, so what thermalization process here really means for this system is how do we transfer energy in the space of wave numbers from the very long wavelengths characterized by this homogeneous field to the very short wavelengths that we have sort of in the thermal equilibrium system. And that's what we're going to study tomorrow. Thanks. Our first question. Uh, studies of gross Nouveau models in uh, one plus one dimensions. And of Nambu uh, General Licinio models in uh, three plus one have indicated that there could be spatially inhomogeneous phases uh, near the uh, critical endpoint, which could the fluctuations would greatly alter the nature, perhaps wash out the fixed point. Uh, it seems this would be something that you could easily study within your classical statistical approximation by taking a uh, wave function renormalization for the spatial fluctuations to be negative. It would actually be very straightforward. That sounds very interesting. We should discuss this further. I mean, I mean, typically this. I mean, the, the question is to a certain extent whether you can map it onto a purely bosonic model, right? Yeah, yeah. No, you can map it onto right? a purely I mean, bosonic. Like, All you have to do is take the z for the spatial kinetic term to be negative, and, and then you get spatially inhomogeneous. Phase. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, that could be. Yeah. That could be very some, some, something. And it's not something that I think has been uh, I don't studied. think anybody is. I mean, in, yeah, I don't, so, so, so this, I, this I think, uh, no, I mean, I've never heard. Yeah, particularly the role of, it was in listening to you discuss fluctuations, because people have spent Bubala, Carignano, a lot of time trying to find the solutions, which is insanely difficult. But it's really the fluctuations that are interesting. Both uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, this is. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, this is very interesting to ask. Actually, how do you form this inhomogeneous phase? Also, then when you crunch into this and so forth. No, no, I definitely. But I mean, I must say, I mean, coming back to this, right? I mean, I was surprised how many different phenomena you actually find in, the, in, in just in the vicinity of this critical point, right? With this competing phases and whatnot. And there must be a wealth of this known actually in condensed matter physics. Also, I mean, I, I mean, I couldn't believe otherwise, but somehow. <laughs> As usual, there's a there's sort of a language barrier there also, yeah.
But it's actually, I mean, it's surprisingly difficult to simulate also. Yeah? So I mean, perhaps this is something I should say also. Yeah? Um, so, so when you study these equilibrium systems or so, right, you have this great benefit that you have time translation invariance. So you say you want to study fluctuations or something like this, you can measure them at any time of your evolution, right? But actually, if, you're not, if you have a non-equilibrium system, right, then every single time instant is different, right? So you cannot average along your trajectory. Like at every single time, you have one given measurement per configuration. And so you need a huge number of configurations to actually, say, calculate fluctuation observables or so. So that's, that's why this becomes so difficult, actually. And that's probably why not, nobody has really done a lot of work on that. Further questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, so firstly, I think I found the answer from your slides itself to my question earlier. So the, uh, the statistical fluctuation has a smooth limit when h bar goes to zero in this basis where you take plus the plus plus minus basis that mm -hmm. you take the average of the up contour and down contour. And then this will have a smooth limit h bar goes to zero, whereas the spectral function uh, in the h bar goes to zero limit goes to zero like h bar. So one over h bar times the spectral function is actually the points of bracket. Uh, so in this basis that you have chosen this, uh, uh, I think that is so, so, in, so it, it's consistent in the sense that you can take the, so the phi indeed uh, has a smooth limit when h bar goes to zero and describes the, uh, I think it is. Uh, so okay, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm happy that you're. Happy. I'm not sure I could follow the comment, but <laughs> yeah, it's just that the, you, you take the um, commutator and divide by h bar. That will yeah, be yeah, the. Yeah, that, yeah, that would be yeah, the, yeah, there's an yeah, h bar. Yeah, there's an yeah, so, the, yeah, so that's what spectral function by the h bar should give you the points of bracket. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So, I actually have a question also. So, in, so you showed this nice uh, table of classifications. Um, uh, and, um, so, is it? Uh, and these are all, all for when the limit uh, p goes to zero. Or, or when you take the correlation functions and take the limit where the momentum goes to zero, is it uh, the no, scaling no, no. appear so, so there? Or? No, no. And so, so in principle, you have a scaling as a function of uh, as a function of both momentum and the uh, time arguments, right? So, so in generally, right? I mean, oh God, I mean, <laughs> I would write it down if I would know all the <laughs> exponents <laughs> where they where they must. So is there like Lucius like exponent? Yeah, no, no. I mean, like you have. I mean, so, so look, right? So, so usually you have scaling, say, in the reduced temperature and the my in the in the magnetization, say, for instance, in the Ising model, right? And just like that, you also have you have scaling in the temperature, the magnetization, the spatial momentum, and the frequency, right? In the limit where all of these go to zero. So typically, you will expect Lipschitz-like scaling, or when P or what? Mm -hmm. In this phase transition, you, there could be Lipschitz-like scaling also in the P, and when you look at the function of both omega and P. No, I mean what happens as a function of P, right? Is I mean so so P can also act as an infrared cutoff there, and so essentially, right? I mean it's like the I mean it's like the I mean you just look at the static correlation function, for instance, right? Just the I mean just the, just the susceptibility at finite momentum, right? Then you find that this will scale as I think P to the two minus eta, right? Yeah. This is how the divergence builds up at, at zero momentum, right? Yeah, and so just like that, you now have an additional scaling with time also, right? So a, I didn't have this. I mean, I, so we just computed them for p equals zero. In fact, we have now computed them also at finite p, yeah? and you see this essentially how, how the divergence builds up when you set p to zero. Any further questions? This is about uh, your last slide. So, uh, the, the, you mean the last slide I showed? The correlation length you have estimated. Ah. Ah. So, in this case, uh, for, uh, for, for the case of second order phase transition, this thermal correlation length can itself be diverging, right? So, in that case, how yeah, one. Yeah, 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 okay, good. <laughs> yes. So, in that case, how one distinguish between the long wavelength and the short wavelengths? Okay, so, so I should have, yeah, okay, so I should have been, so, so I should have been more, more, more precise here. So, I didn't really introduce a quasi particle picture out of equilibrium yet. But really, what I mean is, what are the excitations that are carrying somehow the dominant amount of energy, okay? Right? And so, so even at the second order of history, I mean, these are still the hard modes in the system, right? I mean, these are still the modes which are somehow of order t, right, of order of the temperature. Right? And so, so this is, I mean, this is why this kind of things will, I mean, this is why, I, well, this is what you have to accomplish here. Now, if you, I mean, if your system relaxes to, say, I mean, to a critical point, right, I mean, then that's again a very special story, right, but that I don't have anything to say about right, in, this, in this context. 
Any further questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again.